everyone. On behalf of James Madison University's College of Business Diversity Council, I welcome you to our second in our speaker series. This is Creating a Culture of Belonging. And this evening, we're specifically focusing on uh, recognizing implicit bias and responding to microaggressions. I'm Margaret Sloan. I'm the director of and faculty member in the School of Strategic Leadership Studies in the College of Business here at JMU. And I will be moderating this evening's discussion. So before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping items. First, uh, the microphones will be muted throughout most of the discussion this evening, but please feel free to use the chat and uh, comment at any time throughout the discussion and also uh, to include any kind of questions that you have that come up as the panelists are sharing their perspectives with us. If you can designate uh, particular questions that you would like to be asked later with a queue, that will help our uh, back office team to figure out which questions are, are uh, ready for, ready to queue up in that discussion. Also, we will have about um, an hour to speak with our panelists directly and then open it up to more <coughs> Additionally, be on the lookout for uh, resources that will pop up in the chat. Our resource librarian will be posting things from time to time, resources that you can use and uh, incorporate into your responses, tactics that you can employ that uh, apply tonight to tonight's discussion. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Kim Foreman who is the Associate Dean of Human Resources and Administration in JMU's College of Business and also a faculty member in the School of Accounting. She will introduce our panelists for this evening. Throughout her career here at JMU, Kim has been involved heavily in teaching, service, and scholarship. Most recently, she served as the liaison for the project manager and construction team in the renovation of Hartman Hall and Shoker Hall, and also has served as the liaison for this JMU's location in the Small Business Development Center and Institute for Certified Public Managers. She's a member of Beta Gamma Sigma and Beta Alpha Psi. Additionally, uh, she earned her MS in accountancy here at James Madison University and is a licensed CPA in the state of Virginia. Thank you so much for being with us to introduce our guests, Kim. Thank you, Margaret, and good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. I am delighted to introduce our panel for tonight's discussion. Asumini Kamlegeya is a manager within the supply chain and network operations at Deloitte Consulting LLP in the Government and Public Services or GPS practice. Asumini has more than 15 years of experience leading engineering, supply chain and operations projects in the aerospace industry and for clients within the defense, security and justice sector. She has industry experience at United Technologies, Pratt & Whitney. Asumini has led numerous supply chain and operations transformation projects to drive a reliable record of success in logistics and maintenance for her clients. She has a BS in material science and engineering from Carnegie Mellon University and an MS in material science and engineering from Stanford University. Asumini is committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion as a leader at Deloitte and in the community. At Deloitte, she serves in various DEI leadership roles in firm initiatives, including the GPS Bridge Program, a program for diverse new hires at Deloitte. She was also selected as a member of the U.S. Consulting Allyship Council. In her community, Asumini is a member of the planning team for a three-part webinar series on racial equity as part of the Interfaith Dialogue Communities for, uh, excuse me, Interfaith Communities for Dialogue or ICD organization in Fairfax County. In her spare time, Asumini enjoys spending time with her daughters, family, and friends. She also has a passion for mentoring middle school and high school students as part of the Junior Achievement Program and Toastmasters International Youth Leadership Program. Samantha Melendez is a management consultant at Helios HR, an award-winning human capital and talent acquisition firm based in Washington, DC. In her role as a human capital consultant, Samantha serves as a trusted partner to a wide range of clients, helping to improve their ability to attract, engage, and retain a top performing workforce. 
She is also the co-chair for Helios HR's Internal Conscious Inclusion and Belonging Committee, where she spearheads the education and awareness of meaningful diversity, equity, and inclusion topics. She is also an active participant of Leadership Greater Washington's Anti-Racist Leadership Series. Prior to her consulting role at Helios, Samantha progressed her career in human resources and recruiting at Wegmans Food Markets, supporting hundreds of employees. She is a certified professional in human resources, PHR, from HR Certification Institute, and earned her bachelor's degree in business administration from the State University of New York at Buffalo. In December 2020, Samantha graduated from JMU's Information Security MBA program. Inkechi Ijimadu is a manager in Deloitte's supply chain and network operations within the Government Practices Services based in Alexandria, Virginia. Inkechi brings over 19 years of engineering, manufacturing, and supply chain experience in both aerospace and healthcare industries. Key engagements have included product development, life cycle management, and manufacturing operating models, sourcing and procurement, supply chain optimization, and design slash manufacturing engineering process development. Inkechi has led multiple transformation projects in the aerospace, medical devices, R&D, pharmaceutical, and consulting in the civilian and defense sector that have delivered tangible results. She holds an MBA from Cornell University, a BS in mechanical engineering from Clarkson University, and an MS in mechanical engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Inkechi enjoys connecting with friends, traveling, running, and triathlons. Inkechi cares deeply about advancing STEM and promoting science through mentoring and occupies a board seat on WINGS, STEM, and science. Inkechi is committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion as a leader at Deloitte and in the community. Welcome. Thank you, Kim, and welcome to each one of you, our panelists. We are so pleased to have you with us this evening and uh, seeing, hearing about the breadth of the work that you have done throughout your careers up to this point is just uh, delightful, uh, and we know that we will learn much from our conversation this evening. Thank you again. Um, and so to, to build on the Kim's comments to talk a bit more about your experiences in the workplace, each one of you within your organizations and even in your volunteer efforts have been committed to diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, how did you get involved with these efforts and how do you stay motivated when this work gets difficult? Sam, would you kick us off this time? Sure. Thank you so much for having us. Um, you know, I spent a lot of my life like celebrating the rich Latino culture. Um, you know, I was really involved in youth programs going, growing up and I danced in a professional dance company educating youth about the culture. Um, in, in undergrad, I was really immersed in student associations and like really wanting to learn more from all the varying uh, associations that my school offered. Um, but I think my, my inspiration really comes from, you know, my father, he was, um, he was a chief diversity officer at Kodak. He has an extensive HR career. Um, and he used to travel all over the world. And he, when those folks that he met overseas, um, you know, would, uh, they would house him basically, you know, bring him in, have dinner. He would do the same thing when they came to visit the corporate office. So growing up, I sat across the table from all of these amazing individuals and learned so much and realized that that is what I wanted to do. I wanted to continuously be around people and learn about those cultures. And, um, you know, I thought growing up that that's what it meant to be inclusive and that that's what everybody would want, right? Um, but as a consultant, like I, I feel a purpose to facilitate that awareness. Um, I have accessibility to clients, you know, some of the direct contacts at higher levels, you know, I have the opportunity to influence that change. Um, educating colleagues within our DEI program, you know, that can trickle down to our clients and really impact change in, in many organizations. Um, so I immediately got involved in the, the program when, when it became available. And, you know, I feel like I can contribute to bring, you know, social awareness to a lot of the situations we're seeing. And I, I think seeing what's happening in society, um, you know, particularly with the deaths of unarmed black men in, in, in media and, you know, and knowing that there's a lot of counter arguments 
on social media of what's happening that people still think that, you know, that's okay, um, it is a problem. And I think that's the continuous motivation for me is, is that it might just be one or two people I influence along the way, but, you know, the power of educating people can really change, um, change someone's bias um, and, you know, really contribute to, you know, social injustice. So that's why I do it. Wonderful. And what, what a wonderful role model that you had growing up with your father, that's tremendous. I did, thank you. Asimini or MKG, would you like to comment on your experiences, your why for getting into this kind of work? Yeah, sure. Thank you, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you for having us and thank you for this wonderful panel discussion. Um, I think for me, uh, I definitely uh, related to what Sam said a lot. Um, I grew up uh, Ugandan, I'm a Ugandan American, born in Uganda, raised in America, and very much surrounded um, with culture and things like that. But I think what at my core has made me want to, you know, participate in, in giving back in this space of DEI is just my experience. Um, being, you know, uh, Ugandan American um, woman in engineering, right, in the STEM fields. That's not that, there's not that many of us, right? And so I think that um, there's a lot of folks along the way who helped me to get to where I am today. Um, and I just at my core feel like because of the experiences that I've gone through, because of our, you know, the environment now, which we're in and how people, um, how, you know, systemic bias, racism is is kind of prominent and has been. I feel that it's it's something in me that wants to pay it forward and like make sure that I'm also um, impacting the world and the future generations to come. Right, my kids, um, the youth that I help in the community, and so I think it's something that's just passionate in me, just based on my experience personally, and also you know the environment that we live in and wanting that wanting to pay it forward. Um, is something in me. Wonderful, thank you so much for that. And it's a good motivation because it's not easy work, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And Katie, would you like to share on this question? Yeah, sure. Um, similar to Asmin and Sam, um, you know, I am Nigerian, first year generation um, American. So having, you know, coming from um, another country, another background, another culture, has really opened my eyes to a lot of things. As a young girl, um, I was always around, uh, surrounded by different cultures, different ethnicities, different situ um, surroundings. We came from Nigeria all the way to Portland, Oregon. So very drastic, different environment. And being the only um, chip in the cookie dough, as I like to um, uh, put it, you know, you, you get a different perspective on life, on people. Um, you know, someone taught me, I didn't get here by myself. People held me accountable, um, constantly reminded me that, you know, for what, for what that is given, much is deserved or expected. So it was expected of me to, you know, teach, mold, and pull others forward too. And I'm always kind of looking towards that direction of, okay, what else can I do from my perspective? You know, um, not just only, you know, do my part, but leave a legacy a you know a, a you know a stain behind that says really you know KG really wants to include others, be a part of the conversation, and also you know embrace people. I've always been a lifelong learner, um, learner of people, places, and cultures. And everyone I meet, I take from them, and I'm also giving back. So what motivates me in my organization, whether it's being a part of a DNI effort speaking on a panel, mentoring a, um, a youth, or you know, taking a class or traveling to a different um, destination. It all comes with me and I always try to um, bring it, uh, play it forward and bring it back to my community and people who I, 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 um, I encounter. Wow, thank you so much. I love that idea of pulling others forward. And, and you're certainly all doing that this evening by by sharing your expertise and your experience with all of us. <laughs> so we appreciate it. Um, our, our focus tonight is implicit bias and microaggressions. And we're hearing a lot about these terms lately, but many of us don't 
realize exactly what those terms mean or how, how to define them. We'd have a hard time defining them if someone asked us. So we're going to ask you this evening, um, how do you define implicit bias and microaggressions? And also, um, how do you deal with individuals who respond or feel that these are not real issues? They're not real things that people contend with. In case yeah. you'd like to start us off. <clears throat> Or awesome. um, yeah, I mean, do you want to <laughs> go ahead? Yeah, sure. Um, so the way um, implicit bias uh, to me, uh, or the way I interpret it, it's, it's something that really happens at the subconscious level. It's what we um, don't, we don't necessarily know we have it, right? Like there's different, there's different associations that, or that we make with certain um, maybe ethnicities or certain certain factors. Like when you think of like associations, for example, you might hear about the word government and associate uh, capitalism or, you know, like there's different associations you have with different words or contexts. And so, and it might run contrary to your beliefs or values um, and your behavior can be inconsistent with it, right? So I think those are some of the, the characteristics of it. Um, for, for example, like I know, like just to bring, you know, be vulnerable and be personal about my own experience. I think that I discovered because I took an unconscious bias awareness training at, um, my current company Deloitte, I've discovered that I have an implicit bias against folks that have this level of arrogance or, um, perceived level of arrogance. Like I have this perception or this implicit bias sometimes, which I'm aware of now that if someone is, um, you know, in particular, it might be someone who I feel that is really standing up for their point, right? It might be a male figure standing up for their point. And I, my implicit bias is to immediately go to, are they being arrogant? Are they trying to push me down? Like, you know, my point, and it might have to do with just my experience of being a minority in engineering that I always felt like I had to have that up, right? But it's being conscious of that, like it happens at the subconscious level. So for me, I have to take it where if I'm managing my team and people are standing up for themselves and they might be a male figure doing it, I have to recognize that I want the best for the team and I want everyone's opinion to be inclusive. That's my belief, right? So I shouldn't let my implicit bias get in the way of that overall belief, right? So I have to kind of step back, listen, and like be aware of it. So it's, un it's subconscious. I think all of us have some sort of association with different things and it might run contrary and it runs contrary to your beliefs. A microaggression is more outward. So it could be a statement, it could be an action, it can be an incident or something that is, um, that is subtle or unintentional that you're like saying or doing that could be discriminating against a, a marginalized group, right? And so an example of that, that I have in my experience is when I first started at a company as an engineer, um, you know, uh, in aerospace, there was someone who approached me who was, you know, an older gentleman who said to me when I introduced myself, hi, my name is Asamini. And he looked at me and said, do you have a more American name? And I was kind of taken aback by it because I was really like fresh out of school then. And so I just looked at him and said, no, actually I can spell it phonetically for you if you want to like know how to pronounce it. Um, and so that, that to me was, you know, uh, you know, an action, a statement that was made that was maybe he, it was unintentional for him, right. To like be discriminatory, but um, him hearing my name kind of prompted him maybe to have his own implicit bias around it and, outwardly kind of say something that ended up being really, I felt was discriminatory, right? And so I think that's, those are my definitions and examples that I would say. Those are, are great perspectives and, and noting that these are, are subconscious and unintentional kinds of things. So recognizing them is really important and being intentional about thinking about those things. Other comments mm -hmm. from, from our panelists on that question? Yeah, so, um, you know, very much with what Asumini said, she summed it up perfectly. Um, I have very similar thoughts about that. Um, it is that the implicit bias is that automatic reaction that you have. I, I think of it as like an internal criteria and, and our 
like subconscious perception of the world. Um, when you think of that internal voice inside um, of like maybe someone who raised you or people you were associated with, all of that kind of, you know, molds us and shapes us, um, you know, there are very, like biases are not just in relation to other people either. You know, I think it's, it's, it's the food you favor. It's the, you know, the sports teams, um, you know, it's, it's associating, you know, certain pets with certain aggression levels because of experiences that you've had or haven't had. Um, but I think where it weighs heavy, obviously, is are in those human interactions um, where, you know, you could be associating, you know, someone's weight with being lazy or, you know, those types of examples that, you know, you're thinking of people in a certain way um, that doesn't allow that person to to be an individual. And, you know, because your bias is blocking that. Um, and then the microaggressions, you know, I, I think of those very much outspoken as well. You know, those are those implied recognitions of a characteristic or stereotype. And, you know, someone acting on that feeling um, is showing that they have awareness of what they believe you to be um, and failing to see that, again, that person as that individual. Um, and by doing so, you, you sometimes don't allow that person to, to change the narrative of your bias, right? Because if you are have a certain feeling towards them, um, you know, you may not interact and totally see them as the individual that they are. Um, so yeah, those, those jokes or comments can be made, you know, to people which, you know, bucket them or associate them. Yeah, and I, I definitely agree with Asmi and Sam on the points that they made in terms of implicit bias and microaggression. The um the other kind of experience I can share is, um you know from a, a personal experience um that happened to me in university, um you know being selected last on a team, you know that perceived you know notion of whether it was my name that they felt uncomfortable saying or calling, or if it was me per se, or if it was the color of my skin. Or you know, you know maybe the fact that I was the only female, only black person who graduated from my class. Period. Right. So you always have to tread those waters for four years. That's what I dealt with. You know, and being on a you know student uh, a team, you know you're asked to do you know uh, work, and sometimes you may set you know you may turn in a paperwork that's you know it might be the same material but then you get your paperwork back and your grade is lower than your colleagues. It's the same paper. So, you know, as a young person who is coming into her own, um, to understand her own voice, her own power, you know, who, you know, who do you turn to, to be your champion? Or how do you, mm -hmm. how do you kind of um, deal with those, you know, implicit bias or those microaggressions? You know, do you change who you are in the core to fit in or to blood in, or do you silence your voice and become less than what your potential should be? So um, recognizing that we all have impl implicit bias, there's nothing wrong with it because we're going we're going to be biased by just by just chance of where we where we fall in life, right? We're recognizing that there's bias there, and like let's understand that, let's recognize that, and let's solve that for ourselves because you may cause someone to not live up to their potential or being not who they are and feeling that's wrong or uncomfortable so yeah and I think just to um to add on to that second or third question I think um about like people who don't believe that they exist like I think to that like my first impression it, when I heard that is well you must be lucky then you know if you if you essentially are saying that that doesn't exist it means you maybe just haven't experienced it um, or have been on the receiving end of it and you know just because maybe you don't see it doesn't necessarily mean it isn't happening um, you know we see that a lot when I think people used to say well I don't see color um, or I don't you know I don't see that and it and honestly, it just isn't true, you know. And I think I think seeing color is is important. And um, I, I don't know if um, any of our audience members have seen the movie Crash, but I think that movie does a great job um, explaining how one's bias against a certain particularly marginalized group most times um, can come full circle. You know, when maybe you learn from that person or that person saves your life. Um, you know, I think those are things that I wish that you know people understood a little bit more about about bias. Well, and thank you for those perspectives and for, for sharing personal examples. It's not always easy to do that. Um, and you've all experienced uh, implicit bias in, sounds like in your workplace or through your school careers. And 
uh, has has the way that you deal with those situations changed over time and and how um, how did others around you potentially help you deal with those situations? I, I can speak for for me. Um, I think you know going back to what I think someone commented, once you experience it, you want to be a champion for someone else. So for me, I'm always going to be vocal. And when I see something um, something affects someone in a negative way, I'm always going to make sure that that person is okay. So for me, I become more of a champion and have courage for that person. Now, you know, if it happens for, to me, then that's a different story because that's, you, you have to work through those, um, <laughs> those inner demons, right? To, to have that voice for yourself sometimes. And as, um, as, as women or some um, women of color, sometimes that could be difficult, could come out different ways. But for myself, I'm, I'm just more of a nurturer. And I, I try to kind of make sure that whether it's a team or an, an event that I'm, um, I'm involved in, if I see those um, type of activities or aggressions happening, I'm speaking out for that person and I'm listening to what they're saying and, and really validating um, what they are experiencing. I think that's more important, the, the validation and having someone listen and be there for them, being that person's champion. Because I know how it feels to not have a champion. So I'm always trying to, you know, make that environment for someone, um, give that, you know, that uh, that service for someone because it it nurtures, it helps me develop as a person. Yeah, and I, I mean, I definitely, um, what Nkechi said resonates with me as well. I think one of the, another thing is that, that I've changed um, is to be more curious. So like the listening, like if someone says something and I automatically am like, what, you know, uh, that comes off discriminatory to me, um, like recognizing that, you know, I've, I'm aware of my implicit bias, maybe this person isn't, or maybe there, there is something more to it. So just more like listening and, and, and without judgment and asking questions and being more curious. So if they've said something that maybe can come off like um, sort of discriminatory, like asking questions, like, what did you mean by that? Or, you know, tell me more, you know, instead of um, automatically I think jumping to things that's that's changed with me personally over time because the microaggression that I mentioned is an example. The me then is like automatically to like you know be upset by it and maybe like say something out of em emotion. Um, whereas now I'll like sit, take it in, wait until like I've kind of calmed down about it, and then ask questions. Like if it's appropriate to respond right then, it'll be more of a question than a statement. And I think that's the difference with how I've uh, responded to things now. Yeah, I, I like those uh, tactics for diffusing the situation and, and noting too that, that oftentimes it is easier to help someone else through that kind of situation than to deal with it ourselves. So we also need those support system, those individuals who will come alongside us. And, um, and I think as we as we think about moving more into a discussion of a continuation of the discussion of tactics that individuals might employ um, from your organizational experience, um, can you provide some examples of when bystanders or upstanders have uh, come alongside others who are experiencing either implicit bias or microaggressions from others within your organization? And how is that dealt with within your organizational culture? Yeah, I, I can start. I actually had this happen recently. Um, I was on a call and to your point, it's different when it's directed towards you. Um, and, and I was on a call with four seemingly Caucasian women. And I say that, and I can explain that in a second, but you know, I was perceived to be the only woman of color. Um, and we were discussing like an HR project with some employee changes that were happening. And uh, a woman on the call wanted to make sure that all the changes we make were done timely and consistently across the employee um, census. So, um, 
in doing so, the example she chose to use was making sure that a group of people, you know, for example, with a distinguishing letter at the end of their last name, which could identify who they are or their background, um, were not changed when when not everybody else was. And you know, being the only person on that call, I, I kind of felt like my name was used as the example, right? You know, Rodriguez Lopez Melendez, those those names are are have a distinguishing letter that identifies them predominantly as Latino, but um, you know, I, I say that because, you know, I, I had someone that was my ally in that moment, um, but I think very cautious of the environment that we were in being a Zoom call, you know, offline to that conversation and provided an opportunity for that individual to, to kind of learn from, from that, from that um, experience. But the reason I said seemingly Caucasian is because one of the women on the call is half Latina, but she doesn't, you know, have the traditional Latin features, which m many would associate with, you know, darker hair, you know, um, tan skin. So she, you know, did not know. And I think that assumption piece is extremely important too. You know, you can't assume the the, the people that you are around when when you're saying things that you you think you're in a safe space, right? Um, and I, you know, in that moment, I, I did feel kind of frozen, kind of like singled out. I didn't really know what to say if if that was like directed in a way. Um, but it's always important, and we say this a lot in Helios, to assume that positive intent. And I, I think she was coming from a great place, or her intent was there. Um, but you know, that the educational piece is important to to know that you don't necessarily know your audience all the time. And I think that's an important characteristic. So I was very lucky to have you know my manager you know, kind of be my ally at that point and, and step in. And also one thing I would um, want to add is also, you know, but let's, in a situation or a, an event that happened to me um, on a Zoom call, you know, um, uh, uh, most of the individuals who are on the call were, were men and I was the only female on the call. Um, and when it came down to wrapping the meeting and we're all, we all had kind of, um, I would say equal, um, kind of parts in that meeting. When it came down to wrapping the meeting and kind of going over, you know, um, what was said or next steps, it was kind of directed towards, well, in case you, you know, what's the notes, what are the action items, right? So I was kind of singled out as being the woman to like, you know, she would assume that she would take notes. She would assume that she would set up the meetings. Um, so, you know, it doesn't always have to be kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, a woman of color, it could also be like a gender stereotype, you know, bias, right? As a woman on, on the call, you are presumed that you should be the one who's taking notes, you should be the one who's following action items, and you should be the one who's scheduling for a next meetup for, you know, everyone on the, on the call, which are, and we're all equal um, at the, um, at our levels. So um, that was shocking to me to kind of, um, you know, see that, and I had to kind of say, well, you know, I wasn't taking notes, but this is what I've captured. And, you know, let me know when the, you know, the next opportunity to have this call. <laughs> but you, you have sometimes if you don't have that champion, you have to kind of set, you know, assert your authority in a, in a way that makes sense and, you know, and call it out also too. Within your organizational experiences and through the various um, trainings and thinking through some of these ideas, does it seem like there is a, a differential impact or experience with microaggression among genders or uh, other, other intersections that people may have? Do people internalize or deal with microaggressions differently? Um, I think so. I mean, I think when you think about intersectionality, um, you know, that that person who may have three different levels of intersectionality, you know, they may have three different levels of disadvantage, um, you know, three different levels of, you know, things that may be discriminatory towards them. Um, they're certainly more vulnerable in that sense, I think, to to have an opportunity to, you know, be discriminated against. Um, I, I don't think the reaction differs. I, I think the the scope in which someone could, you know, be offended by a comment is is broader for sure. Um, but I think that's that goes back to not knowing who you're among. You know, that's really important to, you know, always be aware and be conscious of what you're saying because you don't know, you know, 
certain features don't make up who a person is. Um, and I think one example I, we shared in our committee once was National Geographic released a, an image of, a, of what a person's gonna look like in America like 20 years from now. And you know, when you think of interracial, you know, relationships, um, you know, we we seemingly are gonna start to blend and start to look more like each other. Um, and and not not completely across the board, but it, it was an interesting perspective that our bias could be so incorrect and you know it could lead us down the road of social challenges. Yeah, and I think that um, to the point of the training piece, I think the what has helped, um, I feel like from my experience and at my organization is that people who take the unconscious bias trainings, like have the realization of or the self awareness more so about mm -hmm. what their implicit bias is. And so when and it's not necessarily like just going to the training classes and then check the box and then you know you you're kind of more self-aware but it's in combination too with those like discussions on your teams you know there's a lot of facilitation of dialogue on at the team level that happens where you might dedicate um a lunch where you're talking and just having conversations around dei and just like understanding each other's perspectives especially when black lives matter you know kind of started like there's there's a lot more dialogue around it so like having the training for knowing what your bias is and also discussing in these small groups with your coworkers, at, you know, within, from my perspective at our organization has helped a lot, like in understanding people's differences, understanding what people's perspectives are, and also like understanding your bias and your role that you play um, in everything. I feel like that combination has helped a lot. Yeah, and, and to, to echo that, you know, I, I think, um, in terms of microaggression, right? I think the result of microaggression can happen, um, can show up in two different ways, right? It could be internally or it can be externally. And um, taking kind of like the unbiased, con unconscious bias training, it was it was interesting because I I was used as an example. Um, you know, they 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 purposely wanted um, one person at the table and everyone ignore that person, right? And how did that person, what, you know, what characteristics or how did that person show up, right? The person can either be withdrawn from the from the group, right? Go goes into a shell, or the person can be aggressive, combative, um, empowered, right? So I think it's important to understand like what is the result of those microaggressions. And then as you understand the result, then you can kind of deal or or kind of work through that, how that person shows up because of those microaggressions. Right, so that person, if you see a team member being more withdrawn, not talking, or just kind of like being different than what you know, then that's a that's a clear sign that something's something's going on. And as a manager or a leader, it's up to you to now approach that person and try to bring that person back to the fold. So I think it's important to understand like the results of um, the bias or microaggressions because it it has a impact on your team, your project, and eventually kind of like your organization, right? How healthy is your organization? You know, as, as you're talking through these issues, um, I'm hearing a lot of, of comments about self-awareness and uh, listening and openness. And those things require a, a lot of maturity, right? <laughs> uh, and so, I think that's that's certainly an aspiration for us to be thinking about those things and, and building those competencies. During our first um, session in the speaker series, one of the panelists discussed the idea of inclusive leadership as a way to diffuse, um, sometimes people get offended by conversations about microaggressions, implicit bias, and, and his comment was, and we need to be thinking about this as um, inclusive leadership. It's a competency that we can build. And um, I wonder if you'd like to, to comment on this notion of inclusive leadership and how these strategies might fit in an inclusive leaders toolbox. And Kate, would you like to take that one on first? Sure. Um, Thank you. One, you know, one thing I, I kind of stress, you know, as as a team lead or even as a, a leader, um, it's important to 
make sure you have representation of every member of your team in terms of their voice and their ideas. Um, you know, of course, you're going to always have someone in your team or organization is that person to speak up most of the times. But for for me, and I, I value myself as an inclusive leader, I'm always making sure that I'm reaching out and making making sure that everyone's voice is being heard and ideas are being understood. So um, in, in the case of, you know, having the, the everyone having the right um, conversations, you know, you want to make sure that you're just not having a conversation with one individual, individual person, that you're including the whole team. And also you're allowing them to us to be um, accountable and giving them authority to, to have an open and very um, safe space to, to, to vet their ideas or their conversations um, and not make them feel that, you know, they're, they're not valuable. So um, to me, inclusive leadership is really bringing everyone to the table and making sure everyone has equal um, opportunity to kind of um, display their thoughts, ideas, um, and and really be and really hearing them without yeah, just, judgment. Mm -hmm. Just to add to that, I think um, you know what's important is like organizations spend a lot of time, you know, building their their vision and and their values and. Um, you know, building the criteria around the people that they hope to employ. And it's really important, I think, for leaders to really model that way. Um, you know, I, I've, I've worked in a place where, you know, that was really important. Like, if you did not live the values, um, you know, you were held accountable for that. And it, it went all the way up, you know, it, 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 those, that did not discriminate based on what level you were on. And I think that's extremely important because as a leader, you know, in many of these cases, you're having the difficult conversations with the employees who, you know, maybe offended somebody else, and, and it's your role to address those concerns, um, to to hold the organization accountable, um, and to have that that corporate responsibility. So I, I think that's important. And again, yeah, the safe space thing is extremely important too. And, and knowing to know your team is to know when something's wrong, um, and then to know like how to approach them and to make sure that they're comfortable in being able to have these conversations. Um, when, when they're not comfortable. Yeah, and I would add on, I think some of the things that both Sam and, and KG mentioned are just um, like that authentic commitment to diversity and inclusion. It has to be visible, like it's a visible commitment that they need to have um, or you need to have as a leader. And I think going back to like just your awareness of bias is if you have that self-awareness, then you're able to react or you are able to outwardly respond to things a little bit differently, right? Mm -hmm. If you have that self-awareness around yourself. And I think also just the humility, right? Like admit, you know, admitting that, you know, you made a mistake, for example, in front of your team and like creating that safe space. So they know that, oh, my, my team lead is really can be vulnerable, right? She's human too, or he's human too. And so being modest and um, admitting mistakes um, and I think I mentioned it earlier, the curiosity, like asking questions and everything. And then just also, I think an, an additional add is having that cultural intelligence, like understanding people's um, understanding and adapting to, you know, being attentive to people's cultures and all the things required there. And it doesn't even have to be ethnicity, right? Like, so I can think of examples where I felt included because, you know, people on my team know that I don't drink, right? And so my team lead was like, instead of going to a happy hour, let's organize a bowling event, right? And that was something that stuck with me so that now I'm kind of conscious of my teams and knowing like who doesn't necessarily um, want to do the happy hours, who doesn't necessarily, you know, who have kids and don't want to do the late you know, after work thing, like maybe we can make it at lunch, you know, gatherings, like just be, thinking of everyone's perspective on your team as a leader and like having that cultural intelligence to understand the differences as well as to understand, um, to get to know people on a personal level and understand like what they don't like to do, what they do like to do and making it an environment where you're, you're able to do things so that you're including everyone. And um, I think the last thing is also having empathy, like just understanding um, if you're empathetic about people's differences, that that shows a lot in being inclusive as well. Yeah. One thing I just want to mention, like, I think what we've been saying, right, you, you have to have a good balance of 
EQ, the IQ, and the CQ, right? Um, you know, people want to work for people who they can they can emulate and also they can see as as someone that they aspire to be, right? The people who you see behind, you know, you see behind me, Barack, Michelle, Oprah, you know, you have um, um, Muhammad Ali, you know, these are inspirational leaders but they have to have a certain um, quality and certain balance of the EQ, the IQ and the CQ in order for people to actually like rise to the occasion and fight for what they believe, right? So, um, you know, it's important to, to, to be an inclusive leader, but one thing at um, Deloitte that we also um, stress is being a solvent leader, serving your, your masses, you know, being, being there to say, you know, hey, you know, yes, I'm a leader, but I'm also here for you. So basically having that balance for them. Wonderful perspective and um, a different way of thinking about leadership than has been part of that historical norm, right? Moving forward, wonderful. Um, and as, as we think about these kinds of, of elements that you've mentioned in creating that environment of belonging in our organizations. What, what kind of changes have you seen in your own organizations in more recent times that would reflect some of these uh, characteristics that we would aspire to? Um, at Helios, um, we we create, created the Conscious Inclusion and Belonging Committee, which is our DEI committee, and um, I, along with another colleague, you know, we we pull a lot of educational information um, because we want our consultants to be aware of, you know, how other cultures that are in the world, you know, other disparities that exist, you know, um, stereotypes, you know, microaggressions, all of those things. We talk about it all, and you know, we 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 have a set of ground rules that we go over every meeting to say this is a safe place. We want to hear from everyone. Um, we want to get uncomfortable. Um, and then we, we allow grace as well. You know, we want people to say that, you know, I have made this mistake before, um, I have said something incorrectly, or, um, you know, and, and that, that's the place that we can all show up. And um, additionally, I was reminded this morning of a tool that, that we have as well, where, you know, it's an anonymous, um, spreadsheet per se, where people can put in, you know, experiences that they've had either at Helios or in prior work experiences so that people can see that these, this is like a list, like these are the things that someone has said that they are offended by um, at some point within their life. Um, additionally, as mentioned in my bio, you know, we, we all were given the opportunity to participate in the anti-racist leadership series. And, you know, we're, we're having really deep discussions with other leaders in Washington, DC, and uh, even around the world, I mean, there's around the nation, I would say there's a, a lot of people that are from other places as well um, about all of these topics of, of social injustice. Um, we have a adversity channel, um, adversity and equality channel on our teams where we're constantly sharing like, hey, did anyone see this news? You know, did you see what, you know, this organization is doing for employees? You know, um, I think like Adidas offered to hire, you know, a certain percentage of black and Latino people, um, you know, those things. And we're writing blogs. Mm -hmm. Blogs are a big part of the work that we do as well to make sure that we're, you know, we're not only educating ourselves, but putting that information out there as well. So, um, you know, we, we focused a lot and I, I think a lot of it is, you know, really got kickstarted um, last summer with everything that was going on. Um, and I, I just think that that's kind of what we've been doing, you know, to make sure that you know, we, we can impact change um, here. Great ideas, wonderful suggestions. Assume. Yeah, and I think, yes, I think it, um, you know, in general, like, a, uh, our organization, I think that the conversations have been more frequent um, around DEI and just um, the conversations amongst each other, like everyone, there's a number of, you know, town halls, there's a number of like conversations across different projects um, that it's, there's an environment in which the leaders are fostered to create this uh, level of inclusion on the teams and to be able to promote that dialogue. So I think that's the biggest difference that I've seen during the course of my my career at Deloitte. And I would have to, you know, uh, Asmi and I work for Deloitte, so it's definitely 
um, a parent there. And I think as, um, as leaders um, in our teams and the fact that we, you know, we, we are inclusive leaders, they, you know, people feel comfortable in asking those questions. Um, you know, living in Alexandria, Virginia, just, you know, 10, 15 minutes away from, you know, the White House and having, you know, events um, that have occurred, a lot of people have like uh, questions and conversations and being able to provide that safe space to have those town halls to talk about it, to give um, those answers from your perspective, because you don't speak for all, you know, people, but having that safe space um, has allowed people to kind of, you um, feel a little bit connected in this, in the time of, you know, a pandemic and being so remote and, you know, having to kind of, you know, draw your conclusions from wherever media outlet or whoever is speaking in your air, but having those opportunities to have those conversations in a safe environment to talk about it has helped a lot of people in their anxiety and mental and mental health as well. Wonderful. Um, and it, it does seem like very challenging work. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, creating that space where people can feel comfortable when there's so much divisiveness in our culture today. What are some of the, the challenges that you have experienced in trying to implement some of these initiatives and create these spaces? And uh, you're, you're pushing through, but uh, how, are you, how are you dealing with some of those specific challenges as well? I will say, I think some of the challenges is that, you know, everyone is coming with different levels of experiences. And, and we say quite frequently, we're all on different journeys. Um, and I think with everything that's happened, DEI is just everywhere right now. It's everyone has their own version of a program or, you know, a safe space. And, and there's no one way to do that right, you know, and that's, that's why it's so important to know like your your employees and, and what they need and, and where they could have an opportunity to grow. And I think the workplace was not always typically a place where, where that was done. And I think now we're in a place where it's important to understand the wellness of your people, um, you know, to be, to have a space to, to share, to, to be forgiven, um, you know, to be uncomfortable, to talk about these things. And um, I think the hard part is that essentially there's not really a reward for people to contribute to to these discussions you know they have to want to be there um and um there can sometimes be resistance to creating that awareness um and i just think in in some cases you know some people of color are tired of the narrative and, and saying that this is this has been our whole life and now everyone wants to get on board and learn about it and so you do find that sometimes um you know that some people may be less resistant and, and feel like this is this is um, too little too late. Um, and, but it's it's great to see that all of this is happening and, and a lot of these programs are being implemented. But to, to my point earlier, there's no one perfect way to do that. And we want to make sure that, you know, when people who are leading these efforts um, are the most qualified people to do so um, and that they're not just selected because they are a person of color, right? But that they are the most qualified person to, to lead this charge in an organization. And, and has those qualities that you've been mentioning, right? That authenticity, because people know. <laughs> people yeah, know. yeah, absolutely. Sumini? Yeah, no, I would say that um, similar to what Sam mentioned, the challenge is really, you know, I, I find that when the discussions are optional, you see the same type of, you know, the same group of folks that do come to the discussions and contribute versus, you know, the people on your projects that you say, hey, they could use, you know, this type of dialogue too. Um, and so the, the challenge is like getting the folks that don't necessarily want to have this discussion um, in the room to kind of um, understand the different perspectives and being open to the discussion and not and sort of being comfortable with being uncomfortable about talking about these things, um, I think is something that is a challenge. And I think it's just change takes time. Like, so um, I know, you know, Deloitte is doing a number of things to try and change the culture um, and, and shift to, you know, just 
just basically shifting more awareness around these DEI topics to everyone. And so I think it's just being patient with uh, the change. Like, you know, it's, it just takes time to trickle down. Yeah, I would definitely second that. Um, definitely takes change and also um, takes a little bit of grace sometimes. People often feel, you know, well, they can't, they can't ask the question or make a comment because it might come off a, diff, a certain kind of way, right? So, you know, coming from, you know, like I mentioned in, in the beginning of the conversation, you know, I'm Nigerian, I'm also American, I'm also in this, <laughs> in the society. So I have a different frame of every, you know, walks of life. Uh, you know, I don't know everything. I'm not the, you know, the, the end all be all. Let's learn this together. And I'm, I'm trying to um, foster dialogue, not judgment. So I think coming into the conversation as, hey, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out some things too. And I'm, ha you know, happy to give my opinion, have to give my, you know, my take on it. But I also want to hear your, your thoughts too. Um, one thing I would say um, throughout this last year, and I don't even know what month we're in, um, <laughs> You know, DNI has affected us from you know a health perspective, a world economic perspective, an organizational perspective, a civil rights you know element. So um, you know, it's been a it's been an equalizer across the board. You can't say that's one person who's not been affected by some you know some mechanism that um, pushes them into a conversation of diversity, inclusion, or equity. Um, so. I think you know this is this is coming at a, a foreseen time in um, in our history. Um, we have technology that has opened up not just you know DNI for United States. You know it's it's a global you know conversation. Um, we're seeing it with our you know with every walks of life, even our kids. You know as they see you know the conversation, the you know sports athletes, you know leaders organization heads talk about it and providing that opportunity to, you know, to have change. And, you know, to ask me point, you know, change is not going to take, it's not going to happen, you know, overnight. Rome was not built in a day. It takes time. Um, but at least we have uh, patience and um, several um, generations that are working together to make that change happen. That's an encouragement. Most definitely. Um, at this point, I think we have some questions already in the chat, so we want to open it up for students. Uh, Dr. Tim Oskan, who is an um, assistant professor in the School of Marketing, is going to be um, helping to identify those questions and bring them forward. Hi, uh, this has been a great conversation. So thank you for uh, coming over uh, to our meeting and, and bringing your insights and expert expertise. Uh, several questions uh, here. Uh, I'll, I'll, I wanna begin with, uh, it, the first one is everybody talks about implicit bias, but how does one train to be conscious of best pra practice? I believe, you talked about this, but could you elaborate on that? Yeah, so I, I was actually kind of looking up, you know, implicit bias tests that you can kind of get online and things like that. So there's actually one with um, Harvard University, if you like Google, you know, implicit association tests. Um, I don't know if some people have taken it and maybe JMU, um, you might have your own uh, implicit bias or unconscious bias training that you deliver. But I would encourage you know all of you to you know go and um, maybe take that type of test. Just and I think someone just posted in the chat. Um, it's very helpful. Like I know that I think I took that one a, a long time ago before you know I had to wait being able to take the unconscious bias train. But any of those tests or those um, the, that implicit test will kind of give you an idea of you know what we're saying is real, like the, it does exist. Um, I, I think when the test, the test that I took, there's things that you might see an image of a overweight person versus a skinny person. And, you know, they kind of flash words for you to see how things are associated. But 
being aware of um, that and just thinking through, like when you're dealing with people, um, what type of what type of associations do you have with different things that you might hear, right? Like, I think if if the introduction for myself went something like, you know, here's Asamini, grew up in Newark, New Jersey, you know, um, in, you know, a lower income neighborhood, like it would have looked very different, right? Like with the the thinking through, like when people say things to you, what triggers you, like what words trigger, what actions trigger, I think is important and taking those tests for one thing, but also being like aware of things. Um, once you, once you hear them, I think hopefully that answers the question. That's great. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, just the awareness is extremely important, but like think about a time when you may have walked in a room and you were the only person, you know, that looked like you and, um, you know, consider what that feels like maybe on a daily basis of being that person. Um, and, and then, you know, go back to considering like the systems in which you were raised, you know, um, reflect on how you were raised, who you were raised around. Um, did you ever want for something like maybe intangible that you couldn't have? Um, and consider like, you know, people who speak different languages have differing abilities, um, you know, different races, different sexual orientations. And, and I always say, consider what it would be like to be that person interacting with yourself. And, you know, are you proud of the, how that interaction goes? Um, you know, are you proud to, to know that you're seeing that person for who they are and, and, and not what you assume them to be? Yeah, that's a, I, I can't add on to any other points. I think those are two great points, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so also, one of our uh, council members posted the link for the Harvard test. She's such a resourceful person, Elizabeth. Here is uh, your credit on this. She's been posting a lot of uh, helpful links. So those who are uh, uh, following this conversation could just take a few minutes to take the test and see uh, see what, what our uh, panelists are talking about. Uh, 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 another question is uh, related to organizations. Uh, what do you believe are ne the necessary steps institutions must take moving forward in order to promote inclusion and diversity in the workplace? Yeah, you know, I can weigh in there. And I think one of the, the big things is just creating a network of allies for people. Um, and I know we all hear that word ally allyship, um, but in the context that I'm talking about are people who are going to genuinely, authentically build uh, lifelong trusting relationships with um, people who are in maybe marginalized groups, not maybe, but are in marginalized groups, right? And so I think if an organization, any organization can find ways so that people have those avenues. And I'm not talking about just a, a, a mentor because someone who's like your same um, ethnicity or same, you know, um, same background can be your mentor, but an ally is someone who's gonna really pound the table for someone using maybe what privilege they might have to do so. And I can give an example of that. Um, and that like my coach right now at my firm is, you know, a Caucasian white male, but I trust him that he has been able to pound the table for me um, at Deloitte. And he's been able to, you know, use his voice in a way in, in many scenarios for um, for things that for, do for doors to open, I never probably would have had happen in some cases. Um, and also if once you have that network of people that, uh, relationships that people can have with folks like that. There can be instances where they might feel discriminated against or experience racism and they have an outlet for someone to go to, to like, you know, in, a, in, a, in an instance where maybe you don't feel like you can speak up in a group when you're hearing some comments being made, but you can actually go to someone and, and, and confide in them rather than just typically going to HR, right, to make the complaint because sometimes it can be more beneficial that way. And, and one, ex one example, just quick example is, um, I was in a room where, you know, there were executives, you know, in my career where they were talking about 
um, an Asian person and saying, hey, are we really comfortable with that person? Is that her person because she's Chinese going to feel comfortable associating with um, these white, uh, this, these white customers that we have. And I was the most junior person in the room. So I didn't feel comfortable speaking up against it. Right. But after the meeting, I immediately met with someone who I viewed as an ally who was on the same level as the folks in that room. And as a result of bringing it up to, um, to this person, they were able to go to their peer and say, Hey, this wasn't really, you know, like this, here's what happened. And there was, you know, it was uncomfortable to kind of, <laughs> bring it up in that context, but to be able to have the comfort to go to someone else who could help, you know, diffuse that or like bring it to the attention is something that is really valuable to be able to do. So creating that network so people have that safe space to go to people is really important. And I would say uh, two things. Um, uh, one, uh, I think people respond more when they have the right context. So yes, definitely providing training, definitely um, providing that, that language that people could feel comfortable in, um, keep the conversation going, not just you know, celebrate it or, or have dialogue on one particular month or when one incident happens, right? Keep the conversation going, hold people accountable for um, following up and being that champion or that ally, right? Um, and two, it's kind of going it kind of goes back to a personal thing for myself. So this year, one one goal for me is to have authentic, you know, uh, friendship and connections, right? You know, I think it starts with the individual, right? Um, make you know, bring yourself to be accountable to understand what um, bias is, what it does to people, and how you play a role in it, and take accountability and you know your friendships your colleagues and your interactions with people. And, and to ask me in point, having that courage to call someone out and say, hey, the comment you made in such and such or in this room or about this such and such, I didn't feel comfortable in it. And this is the reason why. And hopefully they will be, if, if they are an ally or they're a colleague or friend, will have the respect to say, you know what? You're right, let's talk about it or let me understand and, and, and do better and be better. Yeah, and I think there's a certain um, responsibility leadership has to have to, to drive that. Um, when you think about how driven people are towards organizational goals, um, it's mostly because leadership is you know, pushing us in that direction and expecting that of us. And I think that expectation needs to happen when it comes to DEI as well. And um, I think a lot of organizations right now, what we're seeing in the industry is, you know, the revision of their policies, the language within them, making sure that those are inclusive, um, the recruitment practices, um, you know, understanding where they're recruiting people from, um, you know, considering the questions they're asking and the qualifications of certain roles, um, you know, we understand some education minimums and, um, you know, experience levels are required, but, you know, does everyone have that same accessibility to, you know, have those certain specific, you know, experiences? Um, a lot of people are, you know, reviewing performance management and what that means. Um, and, you know, being mindful of certain holidays and time off, um, you know, we see a lot of like floating holidays, right? And that allows people that have certain religious beliefs to be able to, um, you know, use those holidays that to holidays that are important to them, but maybe not, you know, identified under either the federal government or the organization. Um, you know, and I think another part of, of the, the programs that, that's important is to be transparent with it. Like a lot of organizations are doing a lot of things and sometimes the employees just don't know that those things even exist because that communication is not taken all the way through the organization. Um, and so I think it's important also for organizations to promote the wonderful things that they're doing related to DE&I and really get that word out there um, so that employees who maybe don't know programs or training exist that you know they can participate as well. And um, to Nkechi's point, just constantly reiterating that and having that conversation um, on a regular basis. Yeah, these are excellent responses. Uh, there is, a, while, while there is the organizational side, I think there is also uh, the personal side of this. And, and the next two questions, I'm gonna merge them if uh, the audience allows. Uh, they're, they're essentially focusing on how can, uh, as a new employee, as, as a, as, as a beginner, as a fresh graduate, 
how can we have the confidence uh, to voice our uh, uh, concerns when we when we encounter bias or microaggressions uh, how can we navigate navigate through this uh, especially being in an, in an entry position and feeling irre, 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 irreplaceable. So uh, I think uh, this is very personal to our, uh, our audience here being uh, undergraduate students mostly. Um, I can start. I, th I think we are seeing the younger generation stand up more so than we ever have. Um, this, we actually spoke about this recently on, on one of our calls, and um, I think it's important to, to continuously educate yourself to be able to have those conversations in a way that is professional and in a way that is appropriate. Um, you, you don't want to fight hate with hate, right? And you don't want to get anybody, including yourself, in trouble. But, you know, it's important to understand the resources that you have available at your employer, um, you know, and, and to Asamini's point, you know, having that that mentor, that that ally is is a perfect person to kind of bounce those ideas off of, um, you know, to know that the way you're thinking of handling a situation um, would be something that's acceptable. And, you know, lean on leadership. I, I think that's important as well to say, look, I, I, I witnessed this. I want to say something. Um, you know, I want to make sure that, you know, this is supported that I would do this. Um, and I think that's important as well because then they understand that something is off in the environment where so it's okay for someone to say something like that. But in many cases, and, you know, tooting my HR horn over here, you know, we want to say like, do you feel comfortable addressing that directly? You know, you know, we, we're happy to get involved and want to make sure that management is and all of those things. Um, but we want to make sure that employees, you know, can have those conversations among each other. And then I think, um, you know, in, in the in the um, example that I, I gave earlier for, you know, the fact that, you know, I was given a, um, a bad grade and all my other peers on the same paper were not, right? In that instance, I didn't say anything, right? And looking back, you know, I, I, I pretty much withdrew from, you know, my participation or who I was at that time, right? It took me a long time to kind of be that kind of person to say, to stand up for myself. Right. So having that power to like, you know, go to leadership, you know, do it appropriately, it's going to give you so much growth and understanding of what you're capable of. So I think, you know, hindsight um, for me, I wish I had more um, lead people around me to constantly encourage me to stand up when I see something or even if something has happened to me that's wrong. And then there's going to be someone there to help you through and think about the consequences, right? If you don't say anything, what does that do to you internally? You can either, as a result, you can either be inward or outward, right? So you don't want, you know, that to happen. So I think there's, there's, there's power and, and taking accountability and action, but also you'll, you'll feel better when, once you kind of stand up for that um, aggression. And just to add, I think, you know, both Sam and then Kate, you made great comments. Um, to add to that, I was trying to think back to when I first started as a young engineer out of um, school. And I think one of the things to find those allies, to seek out them when you're working is to, they do have, in most companies, they do have like the resource group. So, you know, at the time they had like the African-American Forum, which was an organization that I joined. And, you know, they have the Hispanic Leadership Forum. They have a number of forums now. Um, I know, you know, they have LGBTQ, they have different forums, right? Like that you could join these resource groups. And that's actually a place where you could seek um, allies, right? So you can like, because usually there's um, executive level sponsors for a lot of those groups, and they invite leaders to talk um, and different things. And it's a way to network, a way to meet people when you're first new to the company, and also start to build your network of maybe people who can help coach you and um, guide you and be your allies through these type of moments. So I think that's something to seek out um, when you enter a company. Uh, I think the next set of questions uh, perfectly, uh, oh, it just scrolled down. Uh, it's about allies, uh, being an ally. And I'm assuming considering your positions, uh, you are allies to some other people. I, 
you're hoping or, or if you had a chance to be an ally. And, and the questions, I, I think they are quite personal and, and interesting. Uh, can you be an ally for someone else, even though you feel sometimes you cannot stand up for yourself? And how do, how do you be a good ally without diminishing the person's voice or, or overshadowing the person that you are attempting to help advocate for? So I think being an ally has its own emotional toll. <laughs> so the, the questions are about that. Yeah, and I think uh, to the question about being a good ally without diminishing the person's voice, um, I think that that is important um, by sometimes we listen to talk or rather than listen to really truly listen. And so I think we, you know, if you are an ally, you don't want to diminish the other voices to really like listen and hear the other person's perspective and what they're going through and what their experience is versus making your and try not to make like assumptions or judgments as you're like listening but to really take in what they're saying and understand their perspective and ask questions i think it goes back to the things that we talked about earlier about being really curious um, i think that's a way for you not to diminish their voice is to really try to understand their perspective and i think sam mentioned it before like to you know, imagine yourself in their shoes. Like, how would you, how would you feel? And learn to get that perspective more. That's a, a technique. Um, and I think, you know, it it does take courage to be, you know, to be someone's ally because a lot of the times you're you're gonna have to like, um, you know, speak up for them in instances where it's not comfortable to do so. And so I think. Um, it's really being, again, self-aware of like what you can do. Um, and sometimes the people like I, like I brought up my personal example of who someone is an ally for me, but it's not necessarily him going around saying I'm an ally for her. Right. It's just, that's my viewpoint of what he's been for me. Um, and so making sure that in order to kind of feel comfortable being an ally, you have to have that self-awareness to, to know, like, am I gonna be able to speak up in certain instances for someone um, if they're not able to vocalize for themselves? Because the true definition I think is, you know, you're able to like be the voice for the person who might feel marginalized in any way, whether it's race, ethnicity, or introvert versus extrovert versus, you know, other things too, so. I think, for, for me, it's easier to be an ally for someone because it's kind of like you're ch challenging your own passion um, for making that person better or progression, progressing that person forward through that person. Um, I, I find it hard for myself to speak on things that I'm doing, but it's easier to, to tote on someone else and say, hey, you know, Sam, she's really doing this amazing job. You know, you should check her page out. You should, you know, she's a rising star. She's doing X, Y, and Z. Um, so personally, for me, it's easier for me to tote someone else's horn and or project that person forward or be that person's ally and and promote, promote, promote until I, I have no breath left than um, it is for myself. So um, I guess <laughs> I guess in that instance, um, you know, look at it in terms of, you know, when you're playing, when you're paying it forward for someone else, it will come back to you. Um, it, it shows up in your energy. And I always think I always uh think that, you know, blessings will come if you do good to others, right? Or do good for others, you know? Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And I think it is easier to advocate for someone else sometimes than it is for yourself. And whether that's, you know, a nurturing component or just, you know, you, you, you recognize it more so when it's happening to someone else than maybe when it's happening to yourself. Um, either way, I, I think that component makes it a little bit easier um, to say something. And, and I think the way you approach someone, um, I think it's important to just simply ask them, you know, um, do you, do you, do you need me, my help in navigating this conversation? Um, you know, you don't know the relationship that maybe those two individuals have had. Um, if someone's been dealing with this for years and like, yeah, they're like, yeah, I've been waiting for someone to like listen and, and to advocate for me. Um, so I think that's important. And then also, I think just wanting to stand up because you work in this environment as well. If you think of like a professional work environment, like I don't want to work in an environment where that's acceptable. And if that means that I have to do something to to impact that, then 
you know, the organization is going to be better off as a whole because of it. So, you know, it really is bravery in, in the sense, but um, it's, it's going to make a lot of change for people down the line. And, and you know, all those people that are featured in, in Ketchy's background, you know, they were all brave. You know, those are, those are the things that people remember and, and, that, and that's a change. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, there are two questions related to emotional labor and anger that that is building up uh, and, and becoming uh, leading to composure, maintaining composure, which is uh, the research shows that it leads to job derailment, not being promoted, resigning, uh, turnover and all those uh, negative outcomes. Have you ever uh, personally experienced or, or any stories related to such uh, emotional toll leading to negative outcomes, um, either yourself or, or within your work environment? Yeah, um, I, can, I can share a personal story. Um, uh, not the current um, employer that I, I'm, I'm with now, but, um, you know, I was once in a, in a role where um, typically um, you would manage one module. I was module, I was managing seven modules and working, you know, crazy hours, but I'm very passionate about um, what I was doing. But um, it took a toll on me because, you know, my peers were not doing as much as um, I was doing, but because I was expected to do a certain level of work, um, uh, it just it just made me feel kind of unappreciative, overlooked, overworked. Um, but but having to be judged at the same the same level as everyone else, um, and no one kind of understood the level of work that I was doing. Um, so eventually, I ended up um, you know after talking and being counseled by. Um, the dean of my university when I was getting my MBA, um, kind of taking a different alternate route in my career, which um, has, you know, definitely developed me and I'm appreciative of it now. But I look back as being a manager or as being a leader. And when I'm faced with someone who is thinking of kind of departing a role or having difficulties, I look back to that experience of me um, talking to myself as a younger version of my, as a younger version of my engineering self and saying, you know, I wish there was someone who, you know, took me under their wing and helped me out of that position or that situation. Maybe I could have been a chief engineer or something like that. Um, so yeah, I definitely have had that experience happen to me. Um, but now, now that it has happened to me, I'm more of an advocate when I see it happen to others. And I, I mentor a lot of um, uh, female um, uh, scientists. That's why I'm, I'm very passionate in STEM. And I've been a part of STEM since I was in elementary school, honestly. So it has been something that I want to see more females or more women in, in um, STEM fields and not having the, their, their careers cut short because of situations like this or, um, uh, you know, or, or any kind of, um, events that could have been resolved by having a champion and ally to their defense. Um, who knows what, who, who knows who they could have been, you know? Uh, if, uh, well, there is one little, one other question, if there is time, Margaret, do you think? And uh, I think we do have time for, for one more question. Where okay. This, we're sadly coming to the end of our time, which has gone by so quickly. I know. Uh, this one is a bit uh, macro level. So it's kind of, it's not organizational. It's, well, there is maybe community level or as a society. What do you think we can be doing to root out bias and reject advertising or programming that promotes stereotypes? I think as a marketing professor, I've been seeing the trend uh, in, 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 in advertising and a lot of uh, uh, businesses are jumping into uh, clearly to prevent some of these stereotypes or at least change them. But what do you think can be, I mean, this is of course beyond uh, an individual, it's more of a society issue. Can you repeat the second part of that question? I heard the rule out, what can be done to rule out bias? 
uh, and re uh, reject pretty much anything that promotes stereotypes. Okay. Yeah. Again, things are changing within our society and we can see that, but what do you think can be done further? One thing I suggest is, you know, education, right? Uh, education and being, uh, being involved, having that balance of that IQ, CQ, um, and I think that is where you start, right? Um, educating at a, a young age too, having those conversations early on. Um, you know, a lot of your students come from different parts of um, maybe the, the world or they have different conversations at the coffee table or the dinner table, right? But having that awareness, having those conversations will help along the way. There's no um, right solution. There's no one solution. Um, and it's a, it's a huge problem, but I think it starts with the education. Um, and I, I think that's, that's where we start. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with Nkechi on the education. I think that's why I know I find my passion with like talking to youth about this and we're actually having a, a youth allyship conference to talk about um, this weekend to just talk about with youth that are middle school and high school about these things, like these topics around how do you think about your differences and how do you think about your social circles at school? Like, you know, are there people you exclude? Like different things to, the conversation is important with the younger ages. I know with my, my girls, I'm always like, we're talking about these different things because it starts with educating, I think not just, you know, the adults, but also the youth so that the future generations can change. Um, and then also like taking accountability and like learning perspectives of others on your own. So like for me, the most valuable thing that I've had is that I've started to have people in my circle that are totally different from me, right? I'm like, I'm a Muslim, Ugandan American woman, but I actually have been on the, you know, in, as part of like that interfaith dialogue, I've gotten different perspectives of like totally different folks, right? Like Caucasian, you know, different faiths, different ethnicities. Um, and like, if you make it a point to have different people in your circle who are like more different than you, that's also part of like embracing people's differences and learning people's different perspectives. And so having that accountability on yourself, like I'm not just going to have a circle of friends that are just like me, same, you know, social status, same, no, like widen the scope. Cause if you widen your circle of friends too, you're also getting different perspectives and able to help change that perception or maybe help change your bias on certain things. And then that also in, um, incites change, right? In society, I feel like. Yeah, those are both great points. Um, I, I think um, what we see growing up in movies and, and, and shows, you know, they highlight a lot of stereotypes and I think it's hard to ever, you know, to, to pull yourself away from that and to, 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 to do that education um, and, and, and to seek out something that you wouldn't always necessarily watch or, or read. Um, you know, there's plenty of resources available, um, you know, online and, and everywhere, you know, it's really just that internal motivating factor that, you know, when you look around and, you know, to Asimini's point, everybody in my social circle looks like me. Okay, you know, how do I change that? Um, you know, you have, to, you, have to, you have to be motivated to dive in and, and do that for yourself. Um, you know, in many cases, no one else will do that for you. So I think those, those are two great points that you guys made. Thank you very much. This is all I have. Well, um, again, I just, I want to, to thank each and every one of you, Asamini and Keichi, Samantha, for your time um, that you spent with us this evening, for your honesty, for the wisdom that you've given us, given us regarding tactics that we can use and um, just encouraging us to look for the best in others and model the way through practicing self-awareness and humility um, and through finding our own voices and also encouraging others in that way as well. Uh, you have certainly encouraged and inspired us this evening and we truly appreciate it. Thank you for being with us. And thanks to all of you for being part of this discussion this evening. I uh, want to encourage you. Uh, the, the last part of this conversation was a great segue into our next speaker event, which is gonna take place on March 25th. And 
and further explores this notion of allyship. So be on the lookout for information about that event. Um, we hope to see you then. And until next time, we wish each one of you well. Thank you all so much.